Hey. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Welcome uh, to the Göteborg Film Festival and the release of the sixth annual Nostradamus Report with the title Relevance in a New Reality. My name is Sida Edström and I'm head of industry at the festival and as such I'm also in charge of the editorial programming of uh, the Nordic film market. And um, uh, before I hand over the microphone to our brilliant analyst and writer of the report, Johanna, I just want you to know that there are some people behind the report more than Johanna, even though you're, we don't have your brain, but we try to help you with as much re research and ideas and things as possible. And uh, that is uh, Josef Kullengård standing over <laughs> there. And uh, uh, Osa Garnet. I think Osa actually took the bus in the wrong direction, but she is on her way, but she is also a great help in making the Nostradamus report. Uh, and uh, we also want to thank our main funders for this event, and that is region Västra Götaland, uh, Lindholmen Science Park, Nordisk Film and TV Fund, and our most recent supporter, Kulturakademin, who is also filming uh, this session today. Uh, and now please give a warm welcome to Johanna. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, of course, uh, Sia herself is a massive part of the editorial board. Uh, and yes, bus is in the wrong direction, or no, these are geniuses. They are just very tired at this point of the festival. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, uh, everyone. I'm sure some people will be dropping in, and you're very welcome to just grab a seat. Uh, what's going to happen today is, uh, as per tradition, that I'm going to speak for uh, just under an hour, and then we're going to sit down with some very interesting guests. Uh, two of the panelists uh, today have been our interviewees from this year's report, and the third uh, has been involved many times before. The headline uh, today is uh, relevance uh, in a new reality, and I'm hoping that I'm go we're going to go on a little journey as usual, and then I hope we're going to land on that theme again. Uh, and of course, none of this would be possible without our generous sponsors. Um, the way we make the Nostradamus report, uh, in which we pretend to predict the future is that we speak to people who are working in strategic positions in the industry and who are making decisions today who's, uh, who will come to that will come to fruition in three to five years. So that whatever they're thinking about today or whatever, whatever they are working on solving today is likely to become reality within this window of the close future that we are looking at for the, the screen industries. This is the sixth report, so we can look back uh, and say that we are predicting predicting, pretending to predict the future, describing the future indeed with some accuracy. Uh, and this of course also means that some of the previous reports uh, may be useful to you. And you can find them uh, on the website, jöteborgfilmfestival.se uh, slash Nostradamus, and they're free to download there. I think right now you will also be able to find the, this year's uh, report at that address. And if not, it's going to be there at the end of this session. Every year we look at slightly different topics, <clears throat> and this is driven very much by, by this sort of exploratory interviews, deep interviews of, that we do with the people who are in focus of the report. And it has been rather astonishing to me how, the, how every year the same kinds of themes are bubbling up in very different interviews with people who are working in very different angles or very different edges of, of the sector. So clearly there is some kind of, some, we can rely in some way on the zeitgeist uh, to lift uh, up certain things. <clears throat> and the headline, chapter headlines uh, for this year in the report, uh, where they are organized in this manner, are about public funding, about what's happening with streaming, uh, about how the role of cinema is shifting in this new landscape, uh, and then a little bit about how I think we should start to reconsider how we are talking, we in the film industry we in particular, but of course in the broader screen industry, is how we're talking about technology and technology companies and how we are using um, best practices from technology companies to develop our own work. And then in the end, there is a small chapter also about virtual reality. And today in this session, I'm going to talk uh, in slightly more depth about the first two, but I'm going to be touching on all of these uh, topics. Public funding for audiovisual storytelling in Europe and elsewhere is directly threatened, and that is uh, because of a number of different reasons. 
most importantly, populist parties and ultranationalist parties uh, are shaping public policy, sometimes through winning elections, sometimes through being strong going forward in elections, and sometimes just through existing, forcing other parties to triangulate to the right. And in cultural policy terms, the consequence of this tends to be that, that funding to the arts and funding to independent journalism uh, is cut. Um, especially with the targeted efforts to shut down minority voices, uh, equality programs, anything that, has to, that is uh, artistically experimental or very niche. Uh, and as we've learned now this year with Denmark, even co-productions, because if you're populist enough, you can think about co-productions as foreign and documentaries being suspicious if they're made in a language other than your own. Uh, and then, of course, where the, the far right really gets political power, censorship follows almost, uh, almost immediately. And the, these same parties and these same political powers, of course, have a big distaste for free, the free press. And this affects funding for public service media houses. And these, we know, uh, are also big investors in TV, drama and film and important buyers for local and uh, art house content as well in their markets. So these are very direct uh, effects. All of this is happening in a broader political context, the context where we're going to see in the next three to five years, ten years certainly, uh, increasing costs for climate-related extreme weather events, climate-related migration, of course, and the world overall is likely to be destabilizing, and we know that a recession is coming. And all of these things happening at the same time mean that it's going to be very costly, politically expensive, for an individual politician to stand up and fight for the arts. Which is ironic, because in actual sort of national budget terms, the arts funding is tiny. It is very, very small, but it has this big uh, symbolic impact, which means that it is something that it is possible, in particular, uh, for, for, um, for populists to argue about and win, and win fights about. Uh, the prognosis, if we're looking slightly more long term about all of these big things that are happening, uh, is that it's going to get even worse. It's not a coincidence that the theme of this festival this year is the apocalypse. We're hoping, of course, that that's going to um, activate all of us to avoid the apocalypse, but it is definitely a realistic threat. And and I cannot overstate this enough. We are an industry, but we are also humans who are in the business of engaging with audiences that are made out of humans. And that's why it's quite important where what's happening with the ecosystem in which the humans are living. Even relatively small climate change, which we know by this point is inevitable, will affect global food production. And some areas where there are quite a lot of humans right now will be uh, uninhabitable. This is already. This has already happened. So we know that this is going to drive social unrest and, of course, force hundreds of millions of humans on the move. And this will put uh, an enormous pressure on the nation state as a concept, let alone, of course, on the welfare state. And at the same time, we're also, uh, for unrelated reasons, in a historical moment where automation is changing how labor is uh, is going to work, how labor markets operate. So. We also have these nations, and especially the welfare state, that rely so heavily on this idea of a citizen as a worker whose, whose labor can be, taxed, uh, can be taxed, and we're working together towards these specific goals. When labor is disconnected from, from the sort of daily human activity, what happens, what the political consequences are of that, and what the cultural funding fu consequences of that are, uh, is, uh, has a certain amount of urgency. But certainly when people whose identities have been invested in their jobs are losing jobs over, let's say, the next decade, 15 years, we are, that is very likely to help populists in elections. And that would be the case because of this, even if we didn't also have a global humanitarian crisis on our hands. Yeah, so that's bad. Um, in the best case scenario, the best case scenario, 10 to 15 years from now, the middle classes uh, in the global north Will our economies and our lifestyles might look relatively different from what they do today. Certainly they should, or we're, uh, as the saying goes, fucked. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, the young adults of today might see two billion dead in their life lifetime. That's what we're talking about. So that's a little bit stressful. Uh, uh, a small, I mean, an obvious thing that we should think about then in this context is the environmental impact of our own industries and on, certainly on the level of individual productions and so on. If you read Dagens Nyheter here in Sweden, you would have read this week about the environmental impact of server halls, which are, uh, are incredibly energy inefficient today and are taking an enormous proportion uh, and in increasing proportion of the world's um, 
the world's energy reserves are being used for streaming video in practice. Um, so that's something that we're going to have to look at. I'm, I haven't looked at it in the in the in the report this year, but let's just put that behind our ear for something to consider as we're going forward. But I, I think that, that this broader political context is incredibly important when we're thinking about this infrastructure that we've built in Europe, that we're, we're filmmaking uh, and, and any kind of audiovisual storytelling in small languages in particular is relying on this public funding that will be put under uh, such enormous pressure. We have an idea in Europe that arts are a vaccine against fascism. That if we have free speech, if we have a free self-expression, we will not have fascism again. And the, the tendency, certainly, if we're looking at what's happening across Europe, is we were probably a little bit naive about that. That's not the only answer. But it's important to remember that fascists certainly believe this to be true, and they always have. And this in itself is a very good reason, I think, to resist, uh, to continue to resist and to manifest the multiplicity of voices uh, and representations in our story storytelling. And obviously public service uh, media and, and investigative journalism are at the heart of this. But I don't think that we should underestimate the importance and impact of storytelling, of the multiple voices, of what fiction can do, of representation. A very obvious example of that, of course, is this. I stood here a year ago and said, this movie is going to make a billion dollars. And I remember thinking, I wonder if I'm going to have to eat that up later. I did not, luckily. Uh, I did not predict that it would get a Best Picture nomination um, at the Oscars. If you are in the least surprised at why this movie, which was a lovely fantasy adventure, but perhaps not ultimately one of the greatest cin cinematic uh, masterpieces, even though it is very, very good. Uh, why it resonated the way it did. There are a number of uh, films screened at this festival about things like black poverty uh, in Mississippi and Alabama that I would suggest very warmly that you go and see. All of these things, of course, all of these structures are connected, even in the commercial marketplace. Uh, we are speaking to people's real life needs and real life fears. And I think that the African-American experience is a very interesting example because, yes, of course, there is a lot there about poverty and oppression and, and racism and violence. But also, for a lot of African-Americans today, uh, these issues are about what does it mean to be middle class, to have a professional job and to still have to fear violence every time you fear your home, every time you leave your home. What does it mean to have a life that looks very much like, like anyone's in this room? Um, and still have to worry that somebody is going to hurt you just because uh, of, of who you are. Uh, and I think it's worth considering uh, that if the worst case scenarios come to pass, that is a, a life experience that many more of us will have uh, in the future. We make films and we tell these stories to ask the big questions. What is a hero? What is a human? What is dignity? What is constructive? What is love? What is hope? what is real. And I think that the market cannot answer these questions on its own. I mean, clearly it can contribute, and Black Panther is a very good example of that, but that is not enough. We need to create these spaces where very specific stories can be told by very specific artistic voices. Um, and I mean, and that there are two consequences of this. One is if we feel that the market, the, that the commercial marketplace is doing, is answering, asking these questions better than whatever you're doing, then we should ask our, ourselves whether where our priorities are right. But the other answer, of course, is the other consequence of this is that we really need to fight now for the public funding, which is clearly where the tendency is clearly that it is going to diminish. Um, so last year in the EU, we saw this decision to enforce local content quotas on VOD services. And this said that we would have 30% European content on the VOD services. And this was targeted, of course, to make the US companies, the US giants, contribute to our local production economy here in Europe. And this was met with such horror uh, from uh, the American industry and reading the comment sections, which of course you never should do. But I found it very, very enlightening this time to go on Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and all so on and read the comments of what people, often very progressive people in the industry in the United States, were saying about this decision. And uh, by the way, personally, I think that this kind of uh, legislative tools are very blunt, and I, I don't think perhaps that it's the best way of, of solving this, but I am very much in favor of, of these companies putting money back into the system. 
And I thought about that, and I'm writing about it also in the report, is what, what are, how are they benefiting from this system? And I made a little list. It goes like this. US companies are benefiting from the public funding in Europe, among other things through securing investment and acquiring content funded with tax incentives and other kinds of public money, by working locally and working in the US with talent uh, and filmmakers educated in Europe's publicly funded film schools, which rely on our publicly funded film archives, uh, where the works and the artists are nurtured at our publicly supported film festivals and film markets, where the US companies, of course, uh, are also very welcome to show and sell their product. And that the films are made themselves in the US as well everywhere else in an aesthetic language that is developed to a great degree with public funding because we have countries that believe that formal experimentation has inherent worth and that we should support that. And then we do make breakthroughs, we develop the form, we, I say, as though I personally have anything to do with that. I contribute only with my taxes, but artists, filmmakers, are enabled to develop the, film, the, the, the language of film. And of course, those breakthroughs trickle through all through the industry. And I should say, I'm saying Europe, but of course, this list of countries also includes Canada, uh, for instance, whose very successful publicly supported film industry has an even closer relationship to the United States. And then, of course, on top of these obvious, like these direct benefits, Public funding is used uh, to contribute to distribution and, and uh, screening infrastructure, so things like fiber optic cable in many countries uh, in Europe, certainly in Sweden, and for instance, uh, by, by funding programs for the digitalization of, of cinemas. And I think actually that that list is worth considering if you are making any kind of audiovisual content in Europe in the commercial, in the most commercial end of the marketplace, you too, of course are benefiting just as much uh, as the Americans, perhaps even more uh, from these public funds, even if you're not using them directly. So if public funding is diminishing, we have to ask ourselves some really serious questions. And I think the one question is, how can we stop it? How can we, how can we keep as much of it as possible? And the other is, how should we use whatever we can keep? How do we share diminishing resources? And in a way, of course, it's ironic in the context in, of this wider context of the apocalypse-themed festival, because, of course, that is the question that everybody in every sector has to answer. How do we share diminishing resources? How do we pr protect the resources that remain? But that happens to be also the case uh, here. What cannot exist when we're thinking about what we do at work, what our, our dreams are and what our jobs are and what the practical, logistical and financial realities of our, our work is, what can we do without? And I think it's an interesting thought experiment for each and every one of you. I will now assign you homework to go to a bar or home to your office even next week and think about what, what if all of the public funding were to disappear? Let's say, it, I mean, let's hope it's not going to. I don't think it will. But what if it did? How would we resolve, resolve things then? If we don't have film schools, how do we get, would we get more or less diverse voices as trainees? If we don't have distribution support, what would we do then if we don't have, you see? So this is also a, a kind of a, a gateway question. This is a, a thought experiment that can allow, I think, us to th start thinking in more innovative patterns. What if we cannot rely on the things that we have always been able to rely on? What would we do then? And some of those things will become necess necessary to do. And others, I think, are worst case scenarios that we should perhaps try to avoid. And when it comes to the questions of protecting the resources uh, as much as we, as we can, uh, something that all of the experts are returning to, all, and we will also mention, talk about it in, in the panel, I hope, is better metrics. We all feel that we know, we understand why what we do is important. But if you've ever had to do with a Ministry of Finance, you understand, you will know, that it is not as easy to explain to them why what we do is important. Uh, as it is to each other when we already agree. And I think when we are dealing with, with public money in a time of crisis, when that public money can be used for many very vital and urgent things, I think it behooves us all. I think it is our duty to be better at verbalizing and telling the story and proving why our existence and the continued work is necessary and why in particular that artistic work is so important. Today we can measure everything, as uh, Glenn O'Farrell says in the report. Maybe we should start thinking about how do we measure these things as well. 
And sometimes when I talk about this, people get very upset and they say, but it's common sense and everybody, every good human should understand with their heart that we need to protect these things. Yes, but you know who, ev who else is arguing with feelings and common sense? The fascists. Uh, I mean, if you're a populist, that is literally what you're doing. You're going around saying, don't you feel like you are in danger? <laughs> and then people say, yes, I feel very threatened by people who are not like me, for instance. And then there's no proof enters that. I think our case is stronger. I think we are actually right where they are wrong. But I think it's fair to say that we can, we can demand more of ourselves uh, and of ourselves as an industry. We should be able to verbalize and measure in some manner the impact, the policy outcomes of what it is that we do. Um, efficiency in production, efficiency in, in marketing, and stronger audience strategy are likely outcomes of diminishing resources. And as anybody who runs a business will understand, this is not bad. Actually, this is gonna force us to sharpen our act a little bit, and that's good. Um, that's going to develop us uh, in a positive direction, I feel. Yes. So much for public funding. Now to the streaming landscape. Uh, you all look a little bit terrified um, and very thoughtful. And I'm not promising that it's going to get better, but at least it's going to get super interesting. So three to five years from now, uh, the, the streaming media landscape will have found its shape. And this has been ongoing since we started this report. So, so of course, the tendency is not very difficult to predict. But most analysts now agree that there's going to be perhaps like a handful, maybe five companies that are going to come out on top. And by that, we mean that they're going to have a big market share of households, at least in the global north. Uh, and they're going to have a direct sub subscription relationship to the households. Maybe not all five. Maybe it's so that it, you know, every household will have like three subscriptions or something like that. Perhaps. We'll, let's see how that recession hits. But at least, you know, they, they, there will be a couple that are clearly dominant and in a class of their own. Then beneath them, Maybe we're going to have a local dominant because a lot of these analysts who are working on this when you're reading other people's work, of course, are American or working in English speaking uh, countries. And I think they underestimate the importance of the local language. And I think that there's a market opportunity there for Nordic players, for instance, for European players uh, to, to carve out a relatively big market share as well. Um, we'll see if I'm right about that. And then underneath that, there are going to be the niche services. A strong niche service could have perhaps perhaps 10% of the market, but some of them will be much smaller. But if you're working on a European level or a global level, that can still be a significant business, you know, that can still work. When it comes to the top layer, most people are assuming that uh, Google, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, and Disney are going to come out on top. Oops, sorry. Um, but the, the list isn't quite certain because there are new players entering the marketplace now, and there is still a window where it's possible to come in and make a big dent in what is currently the dominance of, of Netflix. So if you already have the audience, like Facebook does, uh, it could be possible, for instance, if, you can, if they can figure out content, which they don't seem to be doing right now, and they're very busy with their, their um, legislati legislative woes, as they should be, because they've been uh, messing around with our data. Uh, but, so they might be wiped out entirely because of that reason, but it, let's assume that they survive and they continue. They have the audience relationship, so it's possible for them to break into this market. Um, and then, of course, anyone who has the content and a good strategy could also still do it. And there are at least uh, two players that are uh, coming in this year. Disney, of course, is coming in this, coming in this year. But in addition, we're going to see uh, AT&T Time Warner, uh, who are building an SVOD offering now. And they, of course, have HBO, which is strong here in the Nordics, but not particularly strong, actually, uh, in most other places, even though they have a lot of strong IPs. But now they're getting into the game in a serious way. So if you have HBO and the Warner catalog, uh, you have a decent shot at becoming big here in this space. And the other, of course, big uh, player here now is Comcast, NBC Universal. Um, they have just announced, uh, like a month ago, that they're going to release an uh, ad-supported, probably, or ad uh, uh, financed free streaming service. So not a subscription model if you are a, a, a existing cable customer with them. And Comcast, of course, which uh, is the biggest cable provider in the US, and they also own Sky, for instance, um, have a lot of existing customer relationships already. So within the first year, they could reach 52 million homes um, like this. And then, in addition to that, of course, that service will be available on a subscription model to everybody else. So they are also uh, like a clear 
a potential player here. And then we haven't even looked at the Chinese companies, which of course, uh, especially in other markets than Europe, I think will be able to challenge the Americans uh, quite a lot as well. Now, I think that the film industry in particular, the feature film industry, has really struggled to grasp the importance of this shift and what it means that these technology companies are now entering the marketplace because we're thinking, oh, but Netflix is a technology company. Kind of, yes. What we need to understand is that this is not the same. Like These new players are very different from what our, our thinking has been uh, around Netflix. We're still squabbling over what is a film. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we can continue that conversation, but maybe it's not. It should, that should probably not be the focus of our discussions. Uh, we have bigger things to worry about. Um, I think we may have been distracted also by this development, ongoing development, by the fact that there are just so many buyers now. There are so many commissioners, and if you're making content, I mean, this is a wonderful time to be alive, and this is a wonderful time to make high content TV drama, or high content or high quality uh, feature films. <laughs> And, and that may have distracted us from what's actually what the long-term consequences of this uh, will be. But the meaning of profitability has changed completely. And of course, we have started to learn that when we were thinking about Netflix, right? So we said, oh, but they have a subscription model. That means that they can make a few incredibly high profile, very, very expensive um, productions that will never need to earn their, their keep, so to speak, because the money is earned on the subscriptions and not on the individual work. And this was already to us as an industry that has been selling access to individual works. That's what we've been doing for 100 years. This was a very jarring change. But what we need to understand is that Netflix is still, like their product is still the subscription. Right now, they are throwing money in the content investment. Their, their um, debt is growing at billions of dollars a year. And I think at the end of 2018, the business press reported that Netflix was $10.36 billion in debt, which is like $7 billion more than two years earlier or something like that. And this is probably a really good strategy, by the way, <laughs> because they are winning on the subscriptions race. This is a gamble. Uh, but, but they are also starting to make money and the projections are that if, if none of the contenders crush them, if they don't mess up, they will become profitable and be able to pay off this debt. So this, this strategy worked for them. Le but even so, at some point, you know, the, their, their fundamental business model is still the subscription. So at some point they have to make more money than they spend. Maybe five years from now, maybe seven years from now, but at some point, Unless, of course, somebody who's even bigger comes in and buys all of Netflix, that can also happen. But basically, they need to start making money at some point. Now, that is not the case of most of these new players. Um, uh, these numbers are like two years old, but it's just a very pretty picture. I stole it from Variety, so all credit to them. Uh, this is just to give some idea of the relative sizes of these contenders. So we have Comcast down there. <sighs> Gosh, yeah, 2016 numbers may be very difficult. So Disney and, and Fox are separate here. But then you have Facebook uh, and Alphabet and Amazon and Apple up there. Uh, this is just to give some idea of how much bigger are these new companies uh, than, for instance, Netflix. So here are just some the latest market cap uh, numbers. I just pulled them from off uh, Wikipedia. So up, up there, the fourth quarter, quarter panel, those are the top 10 biggest companies in the world by market capitalization. So you have Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet up there as well as Tencent and Alibaba, for instance, also that are in the media business, right? Um, so Netflix is a purely digital service, which just one goal to have as many subscribers as possible, watching as much of their content as possible. And you could argue that Facebook and Google basically have the same business model. They want as many people as possible to spend as much time as possible on their platforms. Um, their product is advertising. Facebook and Google between them take in about a quarter of all the advertising in the world. These are ballpark figures, obviously, because we don't know about like the every, you know, street ad in India, but ballpark figures, about a quarter. So their interest is that we spend a lot of time on their platform, but then they are also alluring us with many other things than content, right? You're also on Gmail and you're also using their services in other ways. Um, we have this old saying from the 70s that has to, had to do with television advertising. If you're not paying for the product, you, you are the product, or basically what it meant was your attention is the product. And I think today we need to ask 
a much more complicated question, or three different questions. No, they're not actually that complicated, but we need to ask like three questions, which is where is the money spent? Where is the money made? And, and then remember that it's the relationship that is the product. Like, How do these companies build a relationship with the customers? Because that is where, over time, the loyalty is what makes the business profitable. So if we're thinking, for instance, at that, at, uh, about Apple, it's right now not quite clear what their content strategy will be because they are in the hardware business. Primarily, they are selling computers and, and, and Apple watches and these kinds of things, phones, right? Um, is that going to be what they're going to do in the long term? Maybe, maybe not. There are different uh, understandings about how, how well that can go and how sensitive that business is. But you, you remember the very big peak you know, about how, how valuable they are? And there's another diagram that I could show that is about how much money do they have in the bank, which is basically like limitless money. Like there's, that number is so big that I don't even understand that number. They have invested, if, you know, if you're a company and you invest like $5 billion in original content, you would assume that you have some kind of plan for how to show that content to audiences. I'm not 100% sure that Apple has a plan <laughs> for that. I think they have maybe a couple of plans and they're still figuring out which one to, to go by. Um, one way that they could go, and one, one rumor that, is, uh, that abounds, is that if you're using Apple products, all of Apple's original content will be free on their, in their ecosystem. And that would be a way to drive that relationship, that loyalty to, to make me continue using a computer like this and so on. Um, another path that they could do is that they could also create a digital subscription and that wouldn't be available only on Apple devices but, in, but on other platforms as well, which might be actually a good deal if it turns out later that the hardware business doesn't have the longevity um, that content might have. So, but we don't know. And the, and the fact that we don't know might be just very clever strategy, like they might not want us to know yet how they're going to play in this marketplace. But it might also be that internally in the organization, they haven't quite decided which business they're going to be in. Uh, Reuters reported on some internal uh, numbers from Amazon this year, uh, where, which were about how much Prime Video, their, their uh, video service with their original content, is driving membership to Amazon Prime. Now, if you're not an Amazon customer, I should clarify that Amazon Prime is their loyalty program that gives you, for instance, free shipping when you buy very many other kinds of things that their customers buy, media, electronics, groceries, household goods, books, clothes, toys, uh, and a ton of other things as well, right? Um, so it's very much in their interest to make you a prime customer because when you are, you are very likely to buy not just your content, but everything, everything from them, your furniture, your clothes, and so on. Um, so these internal documents seem to indicate that between late 2014 and early 2017, a quarter of the Amazon Prime memberships were driven by the original content that they produce. And it's not a ton, it's like 19 shows or something like that. It's not an enormous amount uh, of things that they are actually that they have made so far. And they have been quite expensive, many of them. And now um, we know, of course, they have the Tolkien license, so we're going to see more, more of, of uh, that kind of, you know, we're going to see very many expensive productions from them going forward. But just those memberships annually uh, give something like $9 billion in revenue. That's a pretty good deal, especially when those $9 billion come with people who, are, who will then buy everything else of your service as well. And if we're thinking about a company like Disney, I think most of us still think of it, oh, but they're a major, like, oh, they're a, well, they're definitely a studio. And I think we should maybe question that. I wonder if they have ever been just a studio. It's funny because they have their Steve Jobs character. They have Walt. Uh, and if you hang out with Disney people, especially, of course, if they're Imagineers, but I think in a lot of places in the organization, Walt, they call him Walt. I don't know why they call him Walt, the first name, not Disney. They talk about Walt a lot. Walt used to say, Walt wants this. Walt, Walt has been dead for quite some time, but there's a company culture that is very much about the long-term plan. And Walt was a tech pioneer, <laughs> by the way, uh, the original world builder. Um, and, and they have had the best immersive entertainment division, which is the Imagineers, for decades uh, and decades, keeping this whole business alive, by the way, during a decade and change when they couldn't make a movie to save their lives. This company sells many things, 
But arguably, film isn't necessarily, I mean, it's at the heart of it, but that may not be the product. Again, it might be something else. Uh, in fact, it's definitely something else. What do Disney sell? They sell backpacks and dreams and mythologies and lifelong relationships. That's what they're, they are in the business of magic, right? Magic and merchandise and experiences. And I think that this long-term plan is very clear when we look at it now. Uh, between 2006 and 2012, they acquired Pixar, which of course is a, a talent magnet, which just sucks up all the best talent in that field and keeps producing original IP, which everybody says you can't make ori an original film work, right? We read this all the time. We say that, oh, Hollywood only doesn't produce any original IP. Pixar does every year, one to two movies of really successful original IP, right? So that's a good investment. Star Wars and Marvel also were bought uh, in that same um, window. And these purchases have, of course, as we know, earned Disney complete box office domination. They are the, they are the player in the, in the market that can really make the old kind of movie making business work. But it's not just that, it's that oh, they already had, and again, if you're European, this is very difficult, the importance of the Disney characters and like, <laughs> If you go on a Disney cruise and Mickey Mouse comes out, you know, like a person in a mouse suit, grown women will, will weep and scream, Mickey, Mickey, like, like they've just met God or, uh, or uh, Mick Jagger, you know. The, so the importance of that is very difficult to understand uh, if, if you're European. But this is true. And now they, they already had one stable of characters like that. And then they have added to that Star Wars and Marvel and all the Pixar characters. That's a really good idea if, you're in, if you have a hundred year plan. And I have to say, I'm very impressed by this, not just because I'm a superhero fan, but also because I like long-term thinking. And I think long-term thinking is what all of us should be doing right now. These guys, at the very least, are doing some long-term thinking. They have purchased store universes that people are so invested in that they will literally tattoo them on their bodies. And people will raise their children intentionally to love these things just as much as they themselves love them, right? And this is before the Fox assets are calculated. So this year, Disney will launch a direct-to-consumer SVOD platform, it's Disney Plus. This is obviously a very rational step in leveraging this relationship. Again, the business is the relationship and putting it directly into people's homes and putting people's credit cards directly into their system. And most of us will, especially if you have kids, you're probably going to be a customer uh, of theirs. And yes, we can measure the success of Disney Plus in subscription revenue, but that is also a very simplistic way of thinking about their business model. Clearly, net profit when it comes to the cost of producing content for Disney Plus is a relatively trivial metric when you have this kind of, of commercial ecosystem and a plan for decades or, or centuries even ahead. Film by film episode by episode, we cannot outspend companies of this size. If they want to work with some talent, they're going to work with some talent. If they want to buy your project, you're going to sell your project to them. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to say no. And by the way, congratulations, that's awesome. Work with everybody if you can. Um, this is not exactly the same as to say that, that, that all everybody in this space or that the tech giants in particular are definitely going to be as successful in the video space as Netflix are. And in fact, we don't even know for sure that they want that. Again, like I was saying with Apple, we are not quite sure what their goals actually are. Um, but one thing that we can say is that right for, for right now, for the next five-year window, everybody who is in this arms race, which is pretty much, uh, well, all of those that I, that I mentioned, Paramount, for instance, is, is not so, not all the majors are covered, but most of them are. Um, it means that they're going to want to keep their content exclusive. If you're universal, you want your universal products to be on the universal service. If you're Disney, you're going to keep it on the Disney service. So we are in the middle of a massive, massive change in the whole financial structure of this industry, which has been based historically so much on licensing um, and selling w windows and, and territories, right? Uh, and then, the, then the, the broadcast licensing after that where that, that content may be pulled back from that market because they need it for their own services, because they're, they're gambling slash calculating that they can make more by owning the, the customer relationship where the long-term value is directly, even if in the short term they might lose money on this. 
So this is very uh, interesting. And this is in particular interesting if you are making content and you're not a one of these majors, right? Because there are still channels that need filling. There are still places that need content that they can't make in-house. Um, and there are broadcasters still and there's so on. There are places where content needs to exist that would have historically probably licensed content from these players. And that's not currently going to be, that, or that's, might talk, that's not going to be available in the same manner uh, anyway, anymore. Um, so that's exciting. Another consequence of that is probably also that it's going to mess with the Windows system. And this is the one thing we predicted in the first report six, well now five years ago, we predicted in the report that we have reached the tipping point uh, or that within three to five years, we would reach the tipping point on the windows. And I have to say, I was a little bit optimistic. I did not understand how incredibly profound the resistance of the exhibitors would be. But now I think we're there. And the reason we're there is that the US majors themselves uh, are now seeing that they can possibly sometimes or always make more money by with w the windows working differently than they historically have, right? So I think that is actually going to change now. That's exciting. Um, but when we talk about Apple, Google, and Amazon, uh, this is, I mean, it was already a little bit complicated. Now I need to complicate it slightly more, uh, which is to say, again, that it's not necessarily in their interest to become the dominant uh, SVOD player, for instance, because, because, again, where are they actually making the money? And right now, of course, for Apple, for instance, that's, it's clearly the hardware. But Apple and Google and Amazon also run marketplaces where they sell other people's content. If you buy things on the Google Play Store or on the iTunes Store, for instance, or on Amazon Digital Files, then, of course, you are also a, a customer in an ecosystem where they're taking a cut of other people's content. And maintaining that may be possibly for some of them or for all of them more interesting uh, than undermining that and, and driving this tendency towards, the, to, to, towards the complete exclusivity. Another thing that is important is that that these uh, Apple, Amazon, and Google are also operating as third-party distributors of premium video content. So people can go on into their ecosystems and subscribe for SVOD services there. So if I'm an Amazon customer, I can go on Amazon channels, and then I can pick all the SVOD services that I want, getting basically like a cable package, except it's not cable, it's, it's all streaming. And, but my money goes to them, and then they keep a cut, we don't know how much, maybe 15%, maybe 30%, and then the rest goes to the SVOD services. And by the way, Amazon, at least right now, they keep the data. So they're the viewership data of me watching other SVOD services through Amazon uh, remains with Amazon right now. Um, I don't know if they're going to be able to keep that up because I wouldn't allow that if I had an SVOD service, but whatever. Uh, a lot of uh, the the growth right now in SVOD subscriptions is coming through these aggregators. Facebook is, are, is right now negotiating also to become an, an aggregator like this, and there are many other competitors in this space. Roku is another one. But of course, if you're Google or Amazon or Apple, just because you have such massive reach, this is actually a very big part of your business. Uh, and they also, and then of course, you would probably watch the content on their hardware, so the Apple TV or the Fire TV or, uh, or so on. And actually, Google is also in the traditional pay TV space, because if you are a cable customer, for instance, and you have a set-top box, it's uh, increasingly likely that the operating system on that set-top box, set box is going to be Android TV. And if your set-top box is running on Android TV, it means that that also has access to the Google Play Store. And that means, and that's a good deal for your pay TV provider and for Google, because you, the customer, can still buy all the things that you want to watch through the Google Play Store, but this players in the sort of traditional ecosystem still get a cut. So, okay, this is all a little bit complicated. You can read about it in the report. But what I'm trying to, to aim at is to say that these big companies, yes, they are a massive threat in the sense that they're never going to run out of money. But importantly, we don't exactly know what business they are in. And I'm not sure that they have decided either. And if they have been very cautious with moving forward in original content production, one of the reasons for that is that they need to think, are they going to make more money by being the infrastructure partner for everybody in the film industry or by making one strand of content that they are selling exclusively? Probably the answer is going to be a combination of both, right? But they need to find that good balance. Yes. Mm. So, we've been writing for a few years now about uh, the, these continuing trends in the exhibition marketplace that cinemas are polarizing towards, let's say, the art house and community-focused spaces 
and the sort of experience, experiential spaces where a lot of the blockbuster content is being consumed. And that's con continuing. And there is also this increasing trend that the sort of mid, mid expensive, middle, middle bro, middle expensive movie doesn't work very well in cinemas anymore. So, so it's also being reflected in, in the production space right now. And as we talked about last year in the report, this is going to mean that we're going to, and also because we're making so many movies still in Europe, finally, it has turned down just slightly. Um, but in the US, it's still continuing. And not all of these can have a theatrical release. It's just physically impossible. So, so even though the, the cinema industry is booming, like it's going really, really well. Uh, it's very, this is a great time in the world to be an exhibitor, it still means that that we're going to need to release films in other ways as well, either on different schedules uh, or we're going to have to be, be able to have small screen premieres uh, in a meaningful manner. Arguably, Netflix has already demonstrated that this is possible. Um, we'll see. But the, I think the important thing is that the five years from now, we, I think a lot of these traditional like hindrances or locks or knots with the exhibitors will have been broken and they will have found a much more natural place in the life cycle of a film. And one of the ways that's going to happen or is already happening, we're seeing is that distributors, for there's just, just integration between, for instance, distributors and exhibitors um, or streaming services and, uh, and exhibitors. The landmark cinemas was for sale in the US and Amazon and Netflix were both looking at it. Both of them turned it down. But but it's not impossible to think that a streaming service would own uh, cinemas. And we're seeing those types of uh, integrations in smaller markets already. Um, so once the giants have shared the subscriptions between them, then what's everybody else going to do? You're going to have to provide a service that either costs less money or that comes from some other part of people's time. Uh, so uh, I had to mention that this year, one of the big buzzes, which I was mentioning automation uh, in, at the, in the in sort of trade shows, is that self-driving cars are coming. And in self-driving cars, you're not going to be driving, so you can be watching television uh, or films. So let's build self-driving cars where the screens, where the windows are screens. And this is something that people are seriously working on. And I both a, kind of love it and be, hate it because maybe let's, let's just have better public transport. Uh, but, but also there is this idea, I think this is a good example of, of something I'm going to talk about in a little while, which is that we have this passion for the sort of come to Jesus tech savior. Like, okay, our business is a little bit wobbly, but self-driving cars will be the solution. I maybe think that that's not gonna be the solution, but certainly there's gonna be even more screens in our lives and more times to watch content. So if you're making content, the market is just going to grow uh, and everything is going really well. I do have to mention this though, uh, as just a small example that I, I ripped off my Facebook uh, stream. Uh, this is a video on Reddit that had been seen two and a half million times of a man waking up after having slept for three hours on his Twitch stream where he was just, the topic was just chatting. He wasn't even playing. He was just talking to the camera and then he fell asleep and the internet became incredibly invested in this and kept donating money to him and things like that. And like, when is he going to wake up? When is he going to wake up? And this is just a tiny clip of the moment when he actually wakes up. Um, but uh, there's everything about this and I could just, I just could talk an hour about just this one picture. So I'm not going to, but, but there's something to, to be reminded of here, which is that when we are thinking about the film and television industries and these spaces, we have a bias, we have a historical bias to always think about big companies and big institutions and big content producers and media houses and what are they going to do and what are the legislators going to do. A lot of the real innovation, of course, and a lot of the real development is happening in very different places. And for instance, things like consumer to consumer broadcasting have real business models now and real stars. And YouTube was just the beginning of that, like YouTubers, which are already like a previous generation and an aging generation. Uh, there's things that is happening after the YouTubers and that is al also happening. And it's quite possible that those will have just as big an impact on how our uh, video market is going to, to be shaped in five years from now as all of these big players that I've talked about uh, today. So 
A central challenge that we as an industry are facing is that there's no such thing as the industry. Uh, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that it took me, you know, six reports to, to think about this. Um, but then I think so everybody else does this as well. We pretend that we have the same interests and long term, I think we do have the same interests. Certainly, if you're making content uh, in a smaller language, um, in a welfare state, uh, we have in, you know, in a in liberal democracy, we have the same long term interests. But in the short term, of course, depending on what you're working with within the industry, your your interests are very, very different. And this is why certain things, certain issues have been so incredibly difficult for us to resolve. Uh, if we want to adjust the window system or if we want to figure out how rights is going to work with streaming, you know, between unions and, and between everybody, this is hard because our short term interests are not the same. And that's very, very reasonable. Uh, but there's also a point now where like, we have been living with iPhones for 12 years and we've been living with YouTube for 14 years and we've been living with video streaming for 20 years. Like, there is some point where we're going to have to stop fighting amongst ourselves. It, it has to stop. <laughs> we cannot continue um, stopping ourselves from saving ourselves by haggling, by keeping our eyes low. You know, we have to look to the horizon and say, a lot of big things are happening now. We're going to have to think about what our long-term goals are. And the good news is that certain things have changed while we were fighting each other. The audience has already decided how they're going to consume the content. So that's great. Like that's, you know, we can't really affect that anymore. That's, that's done. And there are a lot of other decision, technological breakthroughs and new opportunities that are available to us now, better tools to make things work that wouldn't have been possible. Solutions that were not possible 20 years ago or 10 years ago are possible uh, today. Of course, we need to discuss on the national level, on the European level, on the global level, what audiovisual culture do we want? What are these behaviors that the audience has already chosen? chosen? What are the pressures that the multinational companies are placing on this system? Uh, and what kind of public infrastructure, support, regulation do we need for filmmaking to flourish uh, in this new world? It is astonishing to me that the film industry, which is so welcoming of new technology when it comes to production and screening. I mean, we love technology, right? We're great at that. In other areas, we can be so incredibly archaic. I don't know if any of you has faxed a contract in the last year, but it wouldn't surprise me if you had. <laughs> we do funding applications on paper in Sweden, perhaps no, not anymore. I hope we don't do funding applications on paper in Sweden anymore, but that's a pretty recent development. You know, like there's a lot of things that we do are so incredibly inefficient. And this is a real problem because young people are coming into this industry and they're like, what is going on? What is, what is the, we're supposed to be very glamorous and forward thinking. And you start working with film and, you, and you're like, how does it, how do these people even work? We are wasting a lot of time and resources on doing things not great, you know, uh, which is really stupid and short-sighted because it's stopping us from doing the things we're genuinely passionate about, for, like film, for instance. We are, the films are not becoming better because we're inefficient in other fields. And of course, the reason for this is, I think, that there has been a, a historical division in Europe in particular between art and technology. If you're an engineer, then you cannot be interested in the arts and vice versa. So if you are an artist, you're not supposed to care about technology. This is incredibly destructive and it has to stop. Like we cannot continue thinking like this anymore. There's also another more practical reason, which is that 20 years ago uh, and change, when piracy starting, started to become a big problem, Silicon Valley did not respond in a constructive manner to the concerns of the people who actually make the content. I think we can all agree that, that the tech businesses were terrible in their attitude to this. And then I think we also have to look, each other, look at each other or look, look at ourselves in the mirror and say we, the content industries, were also not particularly constructive in our reaction to the tech industry in that situation. This has been a very infected, uh, infected conflict for very long uh, and it's still not resolved. But we cannot let that one conflict stop us from working well and efficiently in the future. That's ludicrous. Um, but there are so, but I think we have to understand with ourselves that there are historical reasons why we have not been, as an industry, very interested in cutting edge technology and we have often viewed it as a threat. But that thinking has to change. And in one way, 
it's going to change because the people who come out of the film schools now, they don't understand this history and they don't have those emotions and they do understand the technology because they use it every day and they've never lived in a world where it didn't exist. But if everybody who is my age or older <laughs> wants to continue to have some relevance in this industry, we need to stop being afraid uh, of these tools that offer real possibilities. So... So the people who are coming up behind us are not waiting for, for permission to innovate. But at the same time, I, I think that neither should we. We should just just, just get to it. Um, but we should do it with a little bit of care because this historical disinterest in technology means that we're not very knowledgeable. Like we as an industry, people who are, are in positions of power in the film and television industries, film in particular, uh, we are not... When we don't know a lot about technology on average. And that means that when a new hype comes or somebody says self-driving cars or blockchain, we're not great at actually evaluating what is hype and what is real potential, what is a useful tool and what is just, you know, where wind. Um, and I mean, blockchain is an example that I'm, we're going to return to it in the panel in just a few minutes, but, but also that I'm, I'm talking about a little bit in the, uh, in the report that it has enormous potential. Um, and the biggest potential is in the sort of most boring areas like bookkeeping and, and contracts and, and things like this. Um, but that doesn't mean, th I mean, the people who come up with these startups with very big visions, some of those are going to work. Uh, but sometimes I feel like we are perhaps not the best at evaluating which of those are the most realistic and, and which of them aren't. And that is um, another reason why I think we need to have a little bit of humility and, and a big dose of curiosity and really start to learn about what the tech industry's ways of working, um, things like iterative design, things like testing, things like really caring about where the audience is, uh, things like targeted marketing, what those can actually do for, you, for us, for all of us, because I think that that's where a lot of the answers are going to be. Um, a few final words about VR. Uh, there is a chapter about it as well, it's very brief, but Basically, I think that VR is becoming less and less relevant for the discussion about film. Uh, it's, it's very clearly its own medium, much more interactive, of course, already going in that direction. Uh, and, and its artistic development is super exciting right now. And the real limitations that we have on, on, on VR development is actually that the, the artists are making great work, but they can't see each other's work because you often you have to go to to Venice or you have to go to Sundance, you, you have to physically travel to the other, another part of the world, world to be able to see the best work because it isn't available anywhere else because that kind of distribution models are not in place yet. And the other thing is that the technology is developing so fast that the artists can't keep up. It takes too long to make a project so often by the time you, you complete something, the technology, the cutting edge of the technology has already moved, moved on. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a lot of really interesting work for filmmakers and storytellers in VR. There is. And if you're passionate about this, there's still time to get in on the ground floor uh, with this technology. And I warmly recommend it. Uh, this picture is from a work that's been a, won a lot of awards that you... <laughs> that is a, it's a sort of mix between an immersive theater performance and a VR piece where which is about, which has like eight live performers and, and it's about the, an Ed Wood, Bela Lugosi film uh, shoot and then you put on the VR thing and then you become a character inside the film. Everybody says it's amazing, it's a completely new medium, it's completely mind-blowing. But it's very vague when I only read about it. It would have been lovely to experience, but we cannot because they, they'd have to build a, a specific venue, right, to show this kind of thing. And that's also, uh, I'm using it here as a symbol to say, again, VR is not going to save exhibition. VR is not going to save the feature film industry. It's its own thing. It's wonderful. Uh, but let's uh, remember that it's it's separate thing. Okay. So I guess that I maybe I have one more slide. Yeah. How do you compete when there is always competition that can outrun you, outspend you, and produces content of a very high quality, only with relevance? When we speak about the importance of curation, what we mean is selecting for relevance. Relevance will power local language SVOD services, public service media, niche and genre subscriptions, your local art house cinema, and ultimately all the consumer to consumer distribution systems that manage to gain a foothold in the market. We don't know which ones those are yet, but we know that they're coming as well. Um, and that's where I'm going to end. And uh, 
the report, where all of these things are covered in great depth, uh, you can find at jetteborgfilmfestival.se slash Nostradamus, and that's also, you can find my information there. They're also in the report. Um, thank you, and I would ask the panelists to join me.